Is it Reza loves Robbie or Robbie loves Reza? It's the best palindrome, you won't be so impressed. Oh, it's the mathematician and the magician laying out the art of deduction. It's RLR. Welcome back, clinical problem solvers. Woo, woo, woo. Robbie, we're yeah. entering a new platform. Ooh. And this platform is YouTube. Yes. And this episode will first be released for our patrons. Patrons? It's TBD. <laughs> <laughs> we never claim to be teaching English. This is 100%. this channel is about diagnosis. Correct. BS. And we're going to release this episode on YouTube. And for those of you who've been following us on YouTube, um, I want to introduce you to Robbie the Baby Blue Jeha. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> And you'll see, where did he go? Oh gosh, there it is. <laughs> this is why, Baby Blue, if you don't, if you don't have Baby Blue in your life, um, that means we haven't met yet. Hello, nice to meet you, but more <laughs> seriously, Baby Blue is the brightest and chirpiest of all colors. It is why iMessage, sneaky iPhone, has its iMessage app in Baby Blue. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's all I got. What else am I supposed to say? Well, Robbie, why don't you set the stage for mm. our YouTube view viewers? Yeah. Like, what are we doing today? Yeah, um, folks, um, we um, are big fans of diagnosis. And I think there are many different ways of um, practicing diagnosis. One, you've um, had Prof. Rez teach you many, many, many schemas. But sometimes you just got to take the practice a different dimension. And so what we do is um, one of us presents a case in aliquot form to the other. So we take a real life case, modify it um, for purposes of compliance with HIPAA, and then break it up into chunks that are really focused on the diagnostic journey. Of course, we really try to re uh, reflect and respect um, other dimensions of clinical care, like the challenges of being in the hospital, uh, the joys of patient care, interprofessional dynamics, teaching, education, et cetera, but the focus really is on diagnosis. And so today I have a doozy of a case. It's, um, it's called the story. And I have an interjection. Ooh. And to clarify for the YouTube viewers. I messed up. I am not familiar with this case at all. Meaning yes. I have zero knowledge. A zero. It's about a zero. A zero. <laughs> knowledge of what this case is. But what I do know, I know one thing. That when yeah. I discuss a case, this yeah. jacket comes off. Because it gets a little too hot in here. Oh my God, I don't think I can present this case anymore. <laughs> I just stare at you. <laughs> um, oh, you interjected me at the key moment, by the way. Here's the, here's the, I'm taking the mic back. Today, the case is of the right shoulder, or is it? All right, hey, where's your seatbelt? Fasten it. Also, this is the moment where I take the stove and I put it on high. You ready? 67. Three days of right shoulder pain. He, um, he noticed it in the middle of the night, three days ago, kind of woke him up. It really hurts whenever he moves his shoulder. He has a little bit of nausea, no vomiting, low grade fevers, has never had this before. So, so this is really helpful. Whenever we're tackling a problem, we have to first frame that problem. We refer to this and clinical reasoning as a problem representation. And it consists of three components. The epidemiology, who is the patient, the tempo of disease, and the clinical syndrome. So here we don't have the background information, for example, the immune status of the patient. But what we do have is the tempo being three days, which is a subacute course, and the clinical syndrome, which is right shoulder pain with low grade fevers and nausea. Now, the low-grade fevers is very important. If this ends up being true on physical exam, we now convert this to inflammation and right shoulder pain. And when you tackle inflammation, there's a simple mnemonic to think about. And maybe I'll enter it on the screen in editing this. But it's the IMADE mnemonic, which stands for infection, malignancy, autoimmune, drugs, and endocrinopathy. And the I is capital because we always prioritize infection first. You must rule out infection before you treat cancer or autoimmune because those conditions require immunosuppression. 
So now let's get to the shoulder. So now I, I'm working with inflammation. I'm thinking infection. Now I want to incorporate the patient's chief concern. I don't like saying chief complaint because patients aren't complaining. They're concerned about a problem. We get to the shoulder. When you're approaching any kind of musculoskeletal system, mm. it's wise to take an anatomic approach. Meaning you start at the skin and imagine an arrow going right through my shoulder. Um, and after the skin, you get to the subcutaneous tissue, you get to the muscle, you get to the bones, and you have to remember the vessels and the nerves. But we always have to remember that pain doesn't necessarily mean it localizes to the site of pain, meaning the pathology doesn't localize to that site. So then you ask the question, what can refer pain to the shoulder? This can include structures in the mediastinum, like the heart. Um, this can include the liver can radiate to the shoulder. The fact that the patient's pain worsens with movement prioritize something anatomic within the shoulder, whether it's osteoarthritis or some other kind of anatomical process. Brilliant. You know what was really cool about that? Both we talked about how you reflect on the dimensions of care and how we present. I absolutely love that. And then also, I think that um, that general principle, MSK equal anat anatomic, ah, just absolutely love that. I don't think I've realized that to that moment that most of our MSK schemas are anatomic, which is awesome. Okay, triage room, you walk in and you can see that he's, he looks uncomfortable. He's like, he's just kind of holding his shoulder, he's guarding it, but you press, 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 press all over the shoulder area, nothing, no pain at all. You move the shoulder and he screams. And you realize that actually he's screaming more when you touch here. So you take his shirt off and you see that the, he has most pain right here at the sternoclavicular joint with no pain on the clavicle and no pain in the shoulder. His vital signs are actually all normal. There's no fever, there's no sepsis physiology. And his exam, you see that he has a, 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 a AV graft or fistula in the right upper extremity, you cannot tell. And he has no other joint involvement, no cardiopulmonary or abdominal or skin uh, abnormalities. Extremely helpful. Of course, the lack of fever does not rule out inflammation. Fever might be the most specific marker of inflammation, but there's several other findings that we must take into consideration, specifically on laboratory assessment, like the white blood cell count, the platelet count, the albumin, the ESR, the CRP, all are, mark are all markers of inflammation. I think the physical exam is quite telling. This patient has point tenderness over the sternoclavicular joint and actually no problems with the right shoulder. So now we bring our attention to joint disease. And know this, Robbie, do I have a great framework for sternoclavicular joint point tenderness? Heck no, I don't. So I have to... It's about a zero. <laughs> a zero, a zero <laughs> knowledge. But what I do have experience yeah. is approaching joint pain, mm -hmm. meaning categorizing it as arthralgia, which he has, mm -hmm. and arthritis. The point tenderness makes me concerned for inflammation of that specific joint. And whenever I think of an inflammatory joint, I prioritize really three to four items. One being most common and usually doesn't give too much inflammation, osteoarthritis. This would be awfully odd location for osteoarthritis because that's usually based on the weight bearing joints. Then I think about infection. Infection's very important to consider. I actually once took care of a patient with um, a septic sternoclavicular joint. That patient had endocarditis that had disseminated. So had gone into the blood and then had eventually seeded that joint. And we actually had to do an arthrocentesis, which revealed that the joint was infected and needed to be debrided. Mm. So infection, crystal disease. Mm. Boy, can crystal disease involve the SC joint? I'm sure it can, but why isn't it involving the toe first or mm. the knee? Why would it go straight to the sternoclavicular joint? So I think, that's, I think that is unlikely as well. 
So I don't think this is crystal. I don't think this is osteoarthritis. The infection is an interesting idea. So I'm keeping that you know, in my differential diagnosis. I'll be very interested in the patient's laboratory workup. And of course, having an AV fistula or graft can be a potential site where bacteria can seed and then can enter the blood to see several, um, you know, different areas. Brilliant. Okay. Absolutely brilliant. Um, white count 14. Labs compatible with his now known end stage renal disease, high creatinine, but no acute issues. ESR CRP also elevated. A CT chest to look at um, the sternoclavicular joint um, is actually normal. There is no evidence of sternoclavicular disease on the CT. This is extremely helpful information. And as I mentioned, fever is just one marker of inflammation. And I believe that this patient did have low-grade fevers prior to coming to your care, Robbie. The elevated white blood cell count, it's always important to ask what the differential is because you want to know, are you dealing with neutrophilia or a funky inflammation? We will talk more about funky inflammation when I present a case to Robbie. But I, I suspect here we're dealing with neutrophil demargination and primarily a neutrophilia in the setting of stress and inflammation. What also supports that is the elevated ESR and CRP. So this patient is inflamed. And whenever you have a patient that's inflamed, infection becomes one, two, and three. Please. Please don't lead with adult onset Stills disease. <laughs> infection is one, two, and three. And if you ask what types of infection, skin and soft tissue, gastrointestinal, hepatobiliary, GI, pulmonary, and then bloodstream infections. So these are the most common. And by the way, when you have end-stage renal disease, you're also immunocompromised. So this patient is vulnerable to potential um, infectious etiologies. So when you, have, when you have inflammation, you're concerned for infection, you wanna use the patient's symptoms to guide your focus, to understand where is the pathology that's driving the inflammation. We only have one site here. I'm sure Robbie asked about respiratory symptoms, GI symptoms, examine the skin. You look for altered mental, you know, he's done all that. We only have one possible site and that's the SC joint. It's point tenderness. There's no fracture there. You have to rule out fracture with any kind of MSK problem. So how do we reconcile the negative CT scan? Well, here, I don't know the answer to this and I would look this up. I would, I would um, explore the test characteristics of a CT scan for inflammation of a joint meaning how sensitive is the CT scan for joint inflammation? So I wonder here, I'm still concerned about the joint. I wonder if there's something we can do in arthrocentesis, and if not, maybe um, do additional imaging after speaking to the radiology, expressing my concern for possible inflammation, specifically infection of that SC joint, and I would obtain blood cultures. Blood cultures show two out of two staph epidermis. Very, very helpful. So how do we approach blood cultures? You take the ball, you pass the ball. Is it the time yet for the take the ball, pass the ball? <laughs> My friends, if you don't play soccer, you're missing out. <laughs> and Reza was, was going to tell you about um, the mentality that we all abide by here at the Clinical Problem Solvers. What is that, Rez? Take the ball, pass the ball. Take the ball, pass the ball. <laughs> My dear friends, I hope that you have... Um, you have many amazing people in your life. This is a soccer ball from my good old days playing soccer in Rhode Island. And there's about 15 signatures on here from Jose, from, from Devin and all amazing people. I wish you <laughs> are surrounded by as much love that I happen to have received on this with this group of people. And with that, I will pass the ball back to you, my friend. And for the audience, I wanna tell you that um, one of my colleagues who played soccer with Robbie said his soccer sales <laughs> was in the Premier League. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> was. <laughs> um, okay, very good. So we have blood cultures. When you're approaching blood cultures, you have to ask a few questions to know if you're dealing with a contaminant or a true positive blood culture. 
what are those questions? What's the organism? How many of the, the samples returned positive? And what was the time to positivity? So Staph Epi is a coag negative Staph aureus. Generally speaking, it's a common contaminant. But what argues against that here? It's two out of two blood cultures and you have inflammation and you have SC joint pain. So I would view this as true, true and related to the patient's presentation. Once you have positive blood cultures and you've identified the organism, you have to ask the question, where did the organism come from? Did it come from the pulmonary tract? Did it come from the GI tract? Huge shout out to a previous episode on Patreon where Robbie presented a case of enterococcus fecalis, which um, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is a, um, what is it, gram? Hold on, don't tell me, you better not tell me. It's a gram positive organism, right? Boom, boom, <laughs> take the ball, pass the ball. Um, it's a gram positive organism, but that patient had colon or rectal cancer, GI cancer, that resulted in translocation of that bacteria. So here we're dealing with staph epi, where does coag negative staph exist? Well, when you're approaching staph aureus, think about the skin, like our flora has staph aureus. Think about the bones, think about the valve, think about the vessels, like a thrombophlebitis. Here, what I'm most concerned is that this patient has maybe a maturing fistula because of the end stage renal disease and maybe they're planning for dialysis. Um, so I would be concerned that that may be the source of the infection, meaning going from the skin to that vascular connection, then seeding the blood, traveling to this SC joint. And by the way, I don't know if it's traveled anywhere else, this staph epidermis. So most patients um, will require more workup, like an echocardiogram. Brilliant, Rez. Um PET CT to look for endocarditis and AV graft infections was negative. A, a TTE for endocarditis was also negative. He started on vancomycin and started to feel better, um, specifically with his pain. His repeat cultures were negative. And I will tell you, you nailed the diagnosis. And um, well before I, I was, there's one key piece of data that you don't need, but I'll tell you for educational purposes. A rheumatology tried to aspirate it at bedside. They couldn't. They couldn't find any fluid enough. To, to, to tap, um, but they asked for a repeat MRI. And on the repeat MRI, um, I kind of modified this case for simplicity. He actually got an MRI and a CT at the same time, both of which were normal. And so they repeated the MRI three days later and it was overwhelmingly positive with evidence of not only sternoclavicular arthritis, but also adjacent osteomyelitis. So to summarize, um, he was given a presumptive diagnosis of coagulating uh, of step epidermis um, uh, SC joint septic arthritis in the context of blood cultures being positive for reasons as you outlined and the inability to tap it, um, but the uh, radiographic evidence of arthritis was confirmed on an MRI, which actually also showed findings for adjacent osteomyelitis. Um, but thankfully, he had no evidence of endocarditis or a distal, distant infection. And so he was presumed to have a transient skin breakdown as, the, as, a, as a potential source of his staph epidermis. Thoughts, what reflections? A, yes, what a case. Thanks for presenting it in the fashion you presented. And this reminds me of a story, Robbie. So I was at the VA in San Francisco. Yeah. We had a patient who had um, just returned from a trip and had fevers and back pain had an MRI with gadolinium at a neighboring hospital. The, bat, the spine was totally normal, no evidence of infection. And then the patient sought care at our hospital. And I remember the patient's back pain was improving and the white blood cell count on the day that I wanted to discharge the patient was 15,000. Mm. And I said, let's discharge the patient. The back pain's improving. We already got an MRI, blood cultures are negative. Um, the ID doctor, the ID fellow who you know, Robbie, she said, Reza, repeat the MRI. I was like, okay, but I, it seems like we're wasting money here. Yeah. Repeated the MRI. Not only was there osteo, there was an epidural abscess and the patient was in the OR the next day. Amazing. The next day. Wow. What, what, what did I learn from that? One, sometimes it takes infection time to, to show itself. Two, 
if the gadolinium, gadolinium is not timed properly, you may miss the abscess and the osteomyelitis. So there's you know, processing that needs to happen that needs to be accurate to increase the test characteristic of a study. So I, I, I really appreciate this case. And it reminds me of that case. Like, was the MRI done correctly in your patient? Two, did the patient just need time to develop the infection? Yo, Rez, that was my, that was my biggest learning point from this case for sure. And I think yeah, to reflect on that in a moment, I actually didn't know much about sternoclavicular septic arthritis and or arthritis in general and learned that um, it is actually one of the, it is a vulnerable to being seated hematogenously because of the, the trauma that it experiences all the time, just being so anterior. We all like rub it and hit it against stuff. So it's vulnerable. Of course, it's not near the knee or the hip um, as in frequency, but it's up there. It's also more common in patients who inject drugs uh, primarily because of the proximity of the subclavian vein to the sternoclavicular joint and how the injection usually happens in the upper extremities. And also patients with end-stage renal disease are disproportionately represented because of the frequency of vascular manipulation in the upper extremities. And so it tends to be more common. Historically, pseudomonas was much more common, but it's, it's receded and now staph aureus is overwhelmingly more common. I also learned that um, the ankylosing and uh, the ax the spondyloarthropathies, like ankylosing spondylitis, can also have uh, uh, sternoclavicular arthritis. Not although probably not this acute. But you know, at the end of the day, neurons fire faster than MRI machines. And what I mean by that is, your patient knows there's a problem before any MRI or CT machine can tell you in many instances. And you can list the number of examples of that over and over again. So remember, evolutionarily speaking, your body has fine, been fine-tuned over millions of years to detect problems. And if your patient's body is telling you that there's something wrong, and even if an MRI machine, which is 20 years old, is telling you otherwise, you probably should listen to those magical neurons. And I think, um, this case is a great, great example of that. Take the ball past the ball. That's a wrap, folks. <laughs>